Thank you again for this invitation. I'm really excited to be here today because as I said, I'm always on the other side. So to be here is amazing. Yes, and I wanted to talk today about what I did during my first postdoc in Argentina also. And this was about regulated cell death in cyanobacteria. And it's also connected to the things that I would like to do in my future. Now I am a postdoc, as Ilka said, at Irineos University in Sweden. Here I work mainly with the ecophysiology of cyanobacteria mainly with Pico cyanobacteria, in particular Sinicococcus. And I am part of this big uh, group that is part of this project that is called Constraining the Past Variations in the Global Biogeochemical Silica Cycle. Friendly, we call it CISIC because it's really long, this, this name. And this project includes people from Lund University and also Linnaeus University. And in my case, I work with these picocianos because we know from some years ago that some picocianobacteria, in particular Senicococcus, can accumulate silica. So I'm working mainly with that and also in other projects related to the ecophysiology of Senicococcus mainly. But my heart is in the bloom forming cyanobacteria. So during in my in my free time and on my evenings, on my nights, I continue working with cyanobacteria and also cell death. At least I try. I guess in the audience, we have people working in cyanobacteria, and I guess we all know that some of them can form these blooms, these nasty accumulations that we can even see them with the satellites. They have an impact, of course, in the water bodies, but also they can produce toxins, so they can be nauseous for us and other animals. So during my PhD, what I did was I followed cyanobacterial blooms in some shallow lakes in the province of Buenos Aires. This is the capital of Argentina. In some shallow lakes that are used for recreative activities, and we knew almost nothing about them. So my plan was to follow them in the shallow lakes and try to know what we had there. And I used some molecular tools to identify the predominant species there. And also I isolated some cyanobacteria from these shallow lakes, mainly the most dominant ones. And then I played a little bit with them in the laboratory. We made some experiments to try to understand the patterns that we saw in the field. When I was finishing my PhD, a researcher came to our institution, this is Victoria Martin, and she came from the land of plants, and she was going to start a new research line with cyanobacteria, so we started to interact there, and she made amazing questions all the time, and once she asked me, okay, they bloom, it's amazing, but then what happened? How they die? What happened after the bloom? And I was like, I have no idea. And really, I had no idea because I was so concerned trying to understand why they grow, why they bloom, how we can control the blooms, that I never asked myself how they die. Never. So after that, I say, I started to look for information about that because I thought the topic was really interesting. And I got to know that we know almost nothing about death in phytoplankton and also in cyanobacteria, right? Some decades ago, we thought that phytoplankton was immortal till they could sink into the sediments or they could be eaten by grazers or maybe they can die because of viral infections or also infection by other parasites. But also cells can die independently of these factors and they can activate some like processes inside the cell that lead to death. So what we know now, combining information from experiments and also information from fieldwork, is that under certain conditions that we can call stressful conditions, for instance, high light or the deprivation of some nutrients, in particular iron and phosphorus, and also UV light, and also the exposure to certain compounds, and also under viral infection, cells start to react to these conditions that are stressful to them by doing different things. For instance, they produce this ROS or this reactive oxygen species. They upregulate or downregulate certain genes. They activate some enzymes we can find in the literature caspase like metacaspases, orthocaspases. I think Marina Clemency will give a talk about this and she will explain this way better than me. So I will not talk about this today, but these enzymes are supposed to be involved in these processes. And also we see some changes in the morphology of the cells when they are exposed to these stressful conditions. And all this has been a term in the literature as autocatalytic cell death, or maybe you have heard about necrotic-like cell death, PCD, this program cell death, or also apoptotic-like cell death. So these terms are really connected to the things that we see in animals, right? And in, in, indeed, we took, well, not we, but people took these terms from the animals. So if we go back to animals for eukaryote systems, mainly for mammals, we have this Committee on Cell Death Nomenclature. 
and they give more or less the rules to study cell death and to which names we should use under which circumstances and so on. And they define two main kinds of cell death. On one hand, we have accidental cell death, and this happens when the cells are exposed to conditions that are really intense, can be a chemical or physical or mechanical situation that kills the cell really quickly. So cells cannot respond to this stressful condition. So the cell died in an unregulated way. But on the other hand, we have instances in which the death is following or is encoded by a machinery that is genetically encoded. And within regulated cell death, we have different types or subtypes. We have apoptosis, we have intrinsic and extrinsic apoptosis, we have necroptosis, phyloptosis, and ferroptosis, for instance. And we will talk today about ferroptosis a little bit. So within regulated cell death, we have a particular kind of cell death that is related to developmental programs. So it's something that is happening in the normal conditions in the organisms. For instance, the embryogenesis or tissue removal or cell differentiation. We need some cells to die in order to have an organ, for instance, or a tissue. But on the other hand, we have some instances in which cell death is like the final attempt to reestablish the normal homostasis of the cell. Let's see this. So we have here the cell and the cell is exposed to a certain stressor. This will cause a perturbation in the homostasis. So the cell will start to react to that and the cell will try to reestablish the homeostasis. So this can lead to the acclimation to this new situation that in the longer time, it can lead to an adaptive stress response. But what happens if the stressor continues or is more intense? The cell will try to reestablish the homeostasis, but if this reaches a point of no return, the cell in the end will die. But in this case, this was an attempt to reestablish. So cells died, but an, as an attempt to reestablish the homostasis. So, so in the end, there is a machinery that is genetically encoded behind this. We have these main two types of cell death. Why we study ferroptosis? Ferroptosis is, a, as a, the title says, is an iron-dependent form of non-apoptotic cell death that was described in 2012. And it is characterized by the um, accumulation of lipid peroxides to lethal levels that cause a damage in the cell membranes. So the membranes are damaged and that causes cell lysis. And it's completely different from apoptosis. Since it was described in 2012, then this cell death pathway was connected to several diseases. For instance, we see that it's connected to cancer, it's connected to neurodegeneration, and also with uh, renal failure, also with immunity. And here we see a review from 2020, and we see that ferroptosis is everywhere. It's connected to different diseases, like nervous system diseases, heart diseases, liver diseases. It's everywhere. So if you want to catch up with the li literature, it's impossible. <laughs> it's really impossible. As I said before, it was described in 2012. And then in 2017, it was described also in plants by Victoria Martin, which was my supervisor during my postdoc. It was also described one year later in some parasites. And then we said, okay, what about this process in cyanobacteria? Is this process or this cell death pathway conserved across the organisms? And if we found this uh, pathway in plants, what about cyanobacteria that are the ancestors of plants? So the first thing that we did was we needed to find a factor that would lead to regulated cell death. So we tried different things in the beginning, and we worked with Senecocystis, this model cell bacteria that grows really quickly, and we know it, and we have the genome sequence, so it's a really nice strain to work with. So what we did in the beginning, we, we tried different things that could lead to cell death. So for instance, we tried hydrogen peroxide that we know from literature that can induce cell death. And here what we see is cells growing in agar plates, and this is the serial dilutions, and we try different concentrations of peroxide. And when we try 10 millimolar, we don't see any growth. And also we try temperature, and we try different temperatures from 28, that our cells were growing in that temperature, 40, 45 degrees, and 50 degrees. And we found that if we expose the cells to 50 degrees, they die. So we say, great, we have at least two factors. We can now try to see if they, they induce or not regulated cell death. To some extent, we can modulate regulated cell death, either genetically or pharmacologically. So what we did was to try specific canonical inhibitors of ferroptosis. At that point, we had at least two. One is this CPX, that is an iron chelator. 
and FER1, ferrocetin 1, that is a lipophilic antioxidant. So we said, what happens if we expose the cells to 50 degrees and also pre the cells with these specific innovators of ferrotosis? So here we, we see an agar plate with the culture growing in these uh, sided dilutions, and we see here the control cells growing under 28 degrees. What happens if we expose the cells to 50 degrees? We see that they don't grow, so we kill the cells. But if we pre-incubate the cells with CPX or FER1, they still grow. So we prevent the death of the cells. So this is a qualitative way to see this. And then this is a quantitative way to see this, in which, again, if we expose the cells to 50 degrees, cells die. This is the percentage of cell death. But if we pre-incubate the cells with these two inhibitors, we prevent cell death. And when we try to do the same with the other factor that we found, the hydrogen peroxide, we couldn't prevent the cell death if we applied FER or CPX. So in this case, we said, okay, we have one factor that is likely inducing something like regulated cell death because we can prevent the cell death somehow, but we have another factor that if we use these inhibitors, we cannot prevent cell death. So we took this peroxide as our situation that can cause accidental cell death and temperature as a factor that can induce regulated cell death. So we went deeper and we, we needed to find like the hallmarks of ferrotosis that were describing animals. We wanted to find them in cyanobacteria. So the second step was do this treatment, in this case, 50 degrees, induces the accumulation of ROS and lipid ROS. As I said, ferrotosis is characterized by the accumulation of lipid peroxides. So we wanted to see if our treatment was doing the same. So here we can see this image that we took from the flow cytometer. And in this light blue, we see the treatment with 50 degrees. So cells were exposed to 50 degrees. And we see that is some accumulation of lipid rose. We use this probe that is body pile that identified lipid rose. And here in these curves, this green and this red and the other green are the control or cells exposed to 50 degrees, but pre-incubated with these specific ferroptotics innovators. And we see the curves here. What we can see is that when we pre-incubate the cell with these compounds, the cells don't accumulate lipid rods. So we prevent the accumulation of lipid rods. Another thing that is hallmark of ferroptosis is that there is a depletion, an early depletion of glutathione in the cells. Glutathione is an antioxidant that will try to detoxify the cells from these lipid peroxidase. So we, we wondered if this treatment could also induce the depletion of these antioxidants. And we also studied the depletion of ascorbic acid because this is another antioxidant that is really important in, in plants or in photosynthetic organisms. And we can see here, this is the content of glutathione and this is the content of ascorbic acid. And we see that when we expose the cells to 50 degrees, we had less content of these two antioxidants. And we couldn't prevent that if we added FER or CPX. With that, we were really happy because this is something that is hallmark also of ferroptosis. So when cells are exposed to 15 degrees, they are using a lot of glutathione in the end to try to, to attack these lipid peroxides. Then we said, okay, what happens if we add externally antioxidants? Can we prevent the death or not? So here I show you again, this is the percentage of cell death. And here we added ascorbic acid and also glutathione. And also we use another antioxidants like liproxatin 1 and vitamin E. When we expose the cells to 50 degrees, but pre-incubate the cells with these antioxidants, we again prevent the death of the cells. Of course, we're really happy with this. And we did more experiments. I think I don't have time to show all the experiments, but these are the main things that I wanted to show you today. Another important thing is the morphology. Is there any morphology that we can relate to ferroptosis? So we use STEM to see the ultrastructure of the cells under different treatments. And here we see the control, the cells growing in 28 degrees. And we see here the membrane of the cell and here the thylakoids. And when we expose the cells to 50 degrees, we see this morphology here and this kind of vacuolation that I, I, I don't know which term we should use but we see this morphology that is completely different to the one that we have when we expose the cells to 77 degrees. In here, the, the cytoplasm is completely condensed and the morphology is completely different when we expose the cells to hydrogen peroxide. So with this, we said, maybe we have a morphology that is characteristic of ferroptosis. With all this information, and other experiments that are in the paper that, if you are interested, we can discuss. We more or less synthesize what is happening in a cyanobacterial cell when we expose them to 50 degrees. 
So we know that there is a decrease in the contents of glutathione. There is generation of ROS and lipid ROS. And mainly what we have is that certain parts of the lipids, that are the PUFAs, are getting oxidized. And then this leads to lipid peroxidation, and this leads to membrane damage, and this leads to ferroptosis in the end. And we can prevent that by using the specific inhibitors of ferroptosis. Of course, I didn't do this alone. So I, again, here we have Victoria Martin, that was one of the PIs, Federico Verdum, that was working with me in all the experiments, and Gabriela Palusad, also from Argentina. She was the ones that described ferroptosis in plants together with Victoria. And of course, Graciela Salerno, uh, she was my PhD supervisor and also my postdoc supervisor. And we did this in Argentina, in Inbiotech and FIBA. And all the things related to the antioxidants were done with this group from Infibe, also from Argentina. And also we made a, a really nice collaboration with people from the University of Pittsburgh and they made like global uh, redox lipidomics. So we were able to see which lipids were being oxidized under the 50 degrees of our treatment. So all these people together contributed to this research. So what is next? This regulated cell death pathway that we describe, we, we describe it in the, in the laboratory, right? under 50 degrees, that maybe it's a situation that we wouldn't find in nature. But what about the real world? What about the environment? Is this operating or not? This is something that we still don't know. We, we know really a little about cell death in the environment. We know a little about how cyanobacteria acclimate to stressors in general, and we know almost nothing about cell death or regulated cell death in cyanobacteria in the environment. And we know almost nothing in the situation of the blooms. And as the phytoplankton is the vast basis of the food web pathways, the way in which they die will have an impact on the rest of the pathways. So if they die here, they will not be eaten by the gray cells, for instance. If they die here and these cells sink and they are exported to the deep sea or the sediments, they will not enter the microbial loop and they will not be grazed by the grazers. From an ecological perspective, Understanding how they die can help us understand what happens with the flow of energy and carbon to different pathways. We know almost nothing about this. So my next steps, I would like to try to understand this. Which factors can induce regulated cell death in the environment? And which is the impact of that in different food web pathways? I hope I can do something about that in the future. So with this, I would like to ask you if you think that some kind of regulated cell death could be operating in your cyanobacterial systems. I know that in the audience, we have many people working with uh, cyanobacteria. And many thanks for listening.